А, ну, как вы знаете, в, извест, в известном фильме на вопрос, в чем... Well, as you know, uh, one very famous Russian film goes like, what's the power, what's the most powerful thing? And uh, the character said that the power is in money, but we know that the real power is in replication, and Joshua will tell you more about it. You again? Hi. We became fast friends yesterday. All right, this is the power of Postgres replication. If you were in my replication training slash tutorial yesterday, you are not going to gain anything from this talk. I love that you're back and thank you. Um, but just to warn you ahead of time, if you're looking for new content, this is not new content from what I spoke yesterday. Uh, we are talking about replica uh, the power of Postgres replication, logically speaking. This is uh, a little different for me, this venue. Let's see if I can work this. All right, I am the uh, founder of Command Prompt Inc. We're one of the oldest Postgres companies in the world. Uh, and uh, we are the oldest in North America. Uh, I am a chair for Postgres Conf Global, which is one of the largest Postgres conferences in the world. It's very similar to this. Uh, it is in New York City this year uh, from March 18th to 22nd. You are all invited. And if you need invitation letters, feel free to email us. We'd love to have every one of you. I am a director for PG Central Foundation, which is a nonprofit. It's the nonprofit that runs the conference. And I am the fo a founder of United States Postgres QL. Uh, and lastly, for no particular reason, I am the, interna the president of the International Consultant Committee of the Chinese Open Source Promotion or Postgres QL Union. Um, in to put that short, I help Ch the Chinese community with Postgres. That's what I do. Uh, if you want to reach me socially, I am on LinkedIn. I know that uh, some of you will reach out to me there. You can find me on Twitter and as on at, at Amplify Postgres as well as at CMD Prompt Inc. Feel free to email me. I likely won't respond. It's not because I don't want to. It's because I'm very busy and traveling. All right, so let's really talk about the important stuff here. We are talking about logical replication, not binary replication. What is it? How does it work? Configuration, limitations, security, considerations, some example architectures, some neat tricks, and management. Oh. So what are the differences over binary replication? Why is replication good, and how does lo uh, logical replication work, that's the wrong word, not location, logical. So here's the differences. Binary replication, which is what we've had for years. We've had binary replication since 8.2 with point in time recovery log shipping. And then in 9.0, we got, it was 9.0, I believe, that we got hot standby. Uh, binary is an exact physical copy. So if you have a primary or secondary master slave, whatever it is that you, terminology you want to use, if they are in the exact same state of replication and you were to shut both of them down and you were to hash the page files on either one, they would be identical. Okay, so it's an exact replicated clone. It is replicated byte by byte unless you are using log shipping to replicate, in which case it is replicated log by log, and each log is 16 megabytes. Binary supports other functionality that logical replication does not. That includes things like point in time recovery. For those of you that don't know, point in time recovery does some really nice stuff, like allows you to restore as the name implies, exactly to a point in time. So if someone is working on the database and they make a mistake, and you need to recover from that mistake, on your point in time recovery slave, you are able to roll forward to an exact point in time, exactly before the mistake, run a backup, get your data back, hopefully not get fired. Binary can also be used for high availability. I've had people argue that you can use logical replication for high availability. They're wrong and they should not be working in this industry. 
You cannot use logical replication for high availability ever. It's a terrible idea. Don't try it. I don't care how customized your situation is. Logical replication is not used for high availability. So why, logical, why is logical replication good? All good things come to those who wait. And the reason I say that is that we've actually had logical replication for years. Uh, all the way back to 8.3, even a little sooner, in fact. Started with a little project called R Server. That morphed into a software project called Sloney. Uh, Sloney was a, ma and still is, is a massive software project, highly extensible, allows you to do things you never thought you could do with a database and arguably probably shouldn't be doing. Um, but we didn't have it native. And that was the thing. You always had to bolt something on. Uh, previously, it used triggers. And triggers are great. Okay, Th They allow you to do things and keep uh, a lot of logic that shouldn't be in the application layer out of the application layer and allows it to stay in the data layer where it belongs. But they are, when under heavy write load, a performance hit. And so there's an issue there because performance is king among everything, right? We always want to go faster. And the problem with Sloney is the more replicas that you add, the slower it goes. Um, it works in, so logical replication natively works in a publisher subscription model where you have a publisher that has publications and you have subscribers that have subscriptions. Subscribers can also be publishers. So you can have a situation, whereas with binary replication, it is a one-to-one. -one. You can go master-slave, and slaves can be masters to other slaves, but you can't write on any slave. It's all read-only no matter what for any slave or replica, whether it's cascaded or not. Whereas with logical replication, you can be in an environment where you have a publisher who has a subscriber who has subscriptions that you can also write to. So it's very flexible depending on what your particular needs are. It also uses native logical decoding. Now what does that mean? When you're talking about your wall, that's your write ahead log, there are different levels of wall that get written to disk. And it's specified by the parameter wall underscore level in your PostgreSQL.conf. It starts with minimal. And minimal is exactly that. You really can't do anything but run your main machine with minimal. And then you have replica. Replica is for replication. And then you have logical. And you do need logical for logical replication. And the great thing about logical is that you don't necessarily have to replicate to Postgres. You can replicate to lots of things, which we'll discuss a little later. So how does logical replication work? It replaces the logical entries in the wall Again, it has a publisher and subscriber model. It uses replication slots. Subscriptions from the subscriber connect to each replication slot. It allows for parallel streams. That's important. So one of the things that it has the ability to do is that if you have a subscription over multiple tables, you can actually replicate those multiple tables all at once versus over one pipe, you have many pipes. Think a one-lane road versus a freeway or a four-lane road. It is not SQL replication, like MySQL. So we can all agree that MySQL's broken. It always has been. And one of the things that they consider a feature is the brokenness of SQL replication. The problem with SQL replication is that when you replicate SQL statements, the results can differ from a primary to a secondary. Consider a situation where you are using something like now. If you say select now, what does it return? It returns your time, right? Your timestamp. Well, if you select now on your master, and then you replicate that now to the slave, that same statement, select now, it's going to be a different time. Instead, we're smart and we do it right, and we replicate the results of SQL operations, not the SQL itself. So when your publisher executes select now, 
and it returns that timestamp, we replicate the return. We don't replicate the statement itself. And in that way, you are able to ensure that your data is identical, assuming no modification on your subscriber, between the publisher and the subscriber. I feel like I'm in a concert hall. So let's configure logical replication. This is a very simple example. We're not going to get complicated here because you can do a lot of crazy stuff with logical replication. So first on the publisher, the publisher is the master source of data to be replicated to the subscribers. On the subscriber, the holder of the subscriptions which connects to the publishers to receive replicated data. Here's the minimum configuration that we can do. This is on the publisher, so this is your master, per se. We have to set the wall level to logical. It will not work with any other level. And in fact, I would argue that unless you're not using replication at all, the only level that you should run with Postgres is logical. I don't see a need for replica. Just use logical, because that way you don't need to restart it, restart PostgreSQL when you eventually do need logical, and you will. You need to deal with your replication slots through max replication slots. By default, you're not going to have enough. As you see here, it says set to at least the number of subscriptions, not subscribers. And this is an important distinction. Subscribers are Postgres installations. So you can have, let's just say one, you have one subscriber. But one subscriber can have 50, 100, 200, 300 subscriptions. So your replication slots have to be enough for the subscriptions, not the subscriber itself. Further, you want to add on to that, not only because you will have more subscriptions that come across, but you may want to run, I don't know, a backup. And if you're running a base backup, you need to have a replication slot unless you're doing something like archiving. You also need to uh, configure your max wall senders. You set this to the max replication slots plus number of subscribers, the physical connecting machines. And I know this can get, it, it, it gets a little confusing when we start talking about, are we talking about the publisher, are we talking about the publication, are we talking about the subscribers, are we talking about the subscriptions? But in this particular case, we are talking about only subscribers plus your max replication slot. So as you can see, this can actually be a significant amount. Because if you have 50 subscriptions, plus you have subscribers that aren't part of a particular subscription, or if you have, say, five subscribers, you could have 250 subscriptions. So you do need to plan accordingly. Okay, uh, da, 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 da. keep in mind that other connections that may use max wall centers, like I said, binary replication, which it, as well as base backups, backup softwares, PG base backup, and PG backrest. We do need to create a replication user. Uh, as a note, this is a feature that's really only available in 10.0 and above. You can use logical replication through an extension called PG logical in 9.6 but I would recommend sticking with 10 or above because it's more, more native, for lack of a better way to put it. Um, when you're setting, creating your replication user, you're going to set your password uh, encryption to scram. You do that from the PSQL prompt as a super user. And then we can create our user, so create user, rep user, with password, super duper rad password, replication. The key here is replication because your user has to have the replication attribute in order for you to connect to actually receive replication streams. And then we have to configure the pghba.conf to allow the subscriber, which has subscriptions, to connect. So here's how we would modify our pghba.conf. As you can see up top, I have the line that we're adding. And what we're saying is we're only going to allow SSL connections because you should only allow SSL connections. At this point, we shouldn't be allowing plain text ever at all, period. I don't even, but unfortunately we do. Um, we're using rep test as our database. Rep user is our user. 
And then 0.0.0 slash .0, .0, 0, that means I don't care who connects as long as they authenticate correctly. And I am enforcing Scram, which is much more secure than MD5. MD5 is, frankly, for a hashing mechanism for passwords, a joke and shouldn't be used. Now that we've configured a publisher, we will configure a subscriber. We will then configure a publication and a subsequent, sub subsequent subscription for replication. After I take a drink of water. All right, so on the subscriber, we have max replication slots, which we dealt with on the publisher as well. That needs to be the number of subscribers plus, did I go backwards? No, okay. Uh, the number of subscribers plus some. Then we have max logical replication workers, which needs to equal at least the number of subscriptions, not subscribers. So logical replication requires a lot of planning because you can't just say, I only have f five subscriptions. Because, I, I mean, anyone who's deployed a database knows that the moment you say I only have five, you're gonna need 12. So you need to do a little forethought. And then plus five for synchronization. And what do I mean by that? What I mean is, is that if you have a subscription that contains multiple relations, it will try and sync them in parallel. So you need to make sure that you have enough max, max logical replication workers and for the parallel streams to work. You also need to modify max worker processes, that max workers is incorrect, it should be max workers processes, to equal max logical replication workers plus one, perhaps more. In fact, I would argue it's a lot more because max worker processes also affects any other thing dealing with workers. Think parallel query, okay? Think other replication, binary replication that you're doing. So anything that's got a background worker that's doing something, your max worker processes interfaces with. Some notes, remember setting these values, when, when you're setting these values, this is, excuse me, a subscriber can also be a publisher, okay? If your subscriber is also a publisher, you will need to make the previously discussed changes to the PostgreSQL.conf and PGHBA.conf for a publisher as well. It's not as simple as binary replication. You can literally set binary replication up in 10 steps. I mean, I, I could fire up my laptop right now, brand new, nothing on it, have it working in 10 steps. It takes minutes. The only long, the only, uh, time-consuming part of binary replication is if you have a large database and you need to take a base backup. Whereas with logical replication, you need to think and plan and document and all that stuff that we all hate doing. Publications exist on a publisher. Subscribers can also be publishers. You may have any number of publications. It is one publication to an in-subscriber model, meaning that you could have a single publication on your master server, but you can have 50 different subscribers subscribing to that publication. They may contain a single table, many tables, or all tables. It's actually a nice feature. With binary replications, it is all or nothing, unless you're using, uh, there's a module from Cybertech where they read, they actually filter the wall stream for binary replication. Uh, it's kind of an interesting utility, but I wouldn't use it in production. So let's create our publication. First, we create publication, my pub, so my publication, for table users departments. Now, I may have a thousand tables in here, but right now I am only interested in my users and departments being shipped off. My pub is the name of my publication. Four table users departments is the tables to be included in the my pub publication. You may also use four all tables instead of four table, 
without a list of tables, which will create a publication for all tables, including create tables created in the future. That's a nice feature. So if you want to logically replicate the entire database, you're not being selective. You're just saying, here's a publication for everything. Okay? You can do that, and then if you add a table later, you don't have to worry about altering the publication. The table will automatically get included in the all tables publication. It's a nice little shortcut. That being said, you would be able to add it anyway because we can alter publications. You can limit the type of DML, so data modification language, allowed for a publication. For example, we've created a publication called My New Publication for Table, Table 1 and 2, with Publish, Insert, Delete. That means the only replication that will go across to your subscriber, excuse me, not your subscriber, your subscriptions, is insert and delete statements. Update statements won't happen. Now, I can't think, actually, of a reason why you wouldn't do updates, but I could see a reason why you wouldn't do deletes. On a subscriber, we create subscription, my sub, connection, and then I use a connection string, dbname equals rep test, host equals bar, and user equals rep user. And then I say publication, my pub. Now before I get into what all that is, I want to talk about the dollar quoting there. Has anybody here ever used dollar quoting? Good. Um, so dollar quoting is a magical thing in Postgres. Anybody here ever try to escape a backslash? Okay, it's a pain in the butt. Right? Well, with dollar quoting, you don't have to. If you use dollar quoting, which is a Postgres specific feature, you don't have to escape anything. It just figures it out for you. It's a nice little token, it just works. Now, the great thing about this is not only does it work in something like this, it also works with insert, update, and delete. And it works within PLPGSQL. So pretty much anything that's native to Postgres that you're using, you can use dollar quoting with, and you no longer have to worry about back ticks, spaces, semicolons, backslashes. It all just magically gets escaped, and things are good. You're also able to, although I don't show it here, you can say something like dollar sign foo dollar sign to identify what you're quoting. So. Beyond that, if we say create subscription my sub connection, then I give my connection name, and then I have my publication. Remember, it's not the publisher, right? Because we, the, the subscriber doesn't know anything about the publisher. That's why we have to pass a connection string. And we say, when I connect to this database, this, pub, this publisher, I need to connect and retrieve the publication, my pub, okay? So it creates a subscription and begins the synchronization process. Once synchronization is complete, incremental changes will be replicated. That's why we need the replication slots. Be careful with large tables. The synchronization process is just a copy, AKA long running transaction. In Postgres, long running transactions are evil. Not as evil as idle in transactions, but still pretty evil. And the reason is, is that when you have an open snapshot, an open transaction, things like auto vacuum aren't able to work on the data. So you can bloat out your database. One of the worst things that happens, and I see this happen all the time, even after all the people that I have yelled at about this over the years, is somebody on Friday, will log into the database for whatever reason, they're gonna run a batch job or something, and they type begin semicolon, and they hit enter. And then they get distracted by the cat videos on the internet, and then they go home. And then all the batch processes that are running over the weekend that we don't run during normal business hours because it slows everything down, run. Auto vacuum doesn't run. And then Monday, the database is twice the size as it used to be. And your performance goes into the hole, and you don't know why. And then you log into the database to find out why, and you see that there's a transaction that's just been running, doing nothing for 72 hours. 
while everything else runs. So if you didn't know this already, I'm telling you now, don't do that. It's bad. All right, so let's get on to some logical replication limitations. DDL commands are not replicated. Alter table, create table. So for example, you can't create a publication and then have the subscription connect and then it magically has the data information. You have to create the table on the subscriber first. This is not a technical limitation. I believe this is really a time limitation. They were working to get the feature in and they figured we have a solution around this problem in that we can just say PG dump schema only or whatever tool you use to manage your schema and you can just point it to your subscriber and say let's create this table and you don't have to worry about it. Sequences are not replicated. This is one of the reasons you cannot, will not, try not to use logical replication for high availability. Because of sequences, your serial, big serial identity columns are not replicated, but you have all the data and you try to fail over what's going to happen. The moment you do an insert, and we all do inserts, right? The moment we do that, we're gonna get violation errors. So you would have to, as part of your failover process, you would have to take every single column that's using a uh, serial, big serial, or identity, which is most nowadays because we mistakenly think that those are primary keys, and we would have to say set, uh, you know, we first we'd have to say select ID, the max ID plus one, and then we'd have to cur select curval on the associated sequence to maximize the current value of each sequence within the database related to each table so that you're not going to get write errors and primary key violations. It's just not worth it. Use binary replication for high availability. Truncate is not replicated, and it really shouldn't be. When I first saw this limitation, it bugged me because truncate is a really good way to manage bulk deletes without bloating out your database. But the problem you have is that you can have an environment where your subscriber is being written to your subscription, I should say, is being written to by multiple publications. So consider an edge server environment where you have four edge servers or even 50 edge servers, and each one of those edge servers is geographically located around the world, and geographical location is how you log in. So in, we've got one in Russia, so our Russian friends log into the Russian one. We have one in the States, our United States friends log into that one, but we replicate or we publish down to a single subscription that's sitting in New Zealand. Well, if United States decides to truncate their, their, publish, their publication, it's not going to discern whether which data to truncate on the subscription. It's just going to delete all of it. So our Russian friends lose all their data too. So that is not what we want to do. Also, large objects are not replicated. Use byte A. Now, I find this one unfortunate. I actually like large objects. Granted, they are a legacy feature. But the nice thing about large objects is that, let's say we put a 90 megabyte PDF into the database. When you retrieve that PDF from a large object, it actually streams you the PDF in 8K chunks. So it uses very minimal resources in terms of memory. If you're using byte A, that 90 meg PDF will be 90 megs minimum all at once. And if you're doing that over multiple connections, you, all of a sudden you've DOSed your database. So be careful there. Here's some continued limitations. You can only replicate tables. So this is another reason why you really can't use it for high availability. There's no views. Now you can have views on your subscriber, of course. That's kind of the point. But you, if you create a view on your, publication, on your publisher, it is not going to replicate. Nor can you make a view part of your publication. It won't work. No materialized views. It's one of the best new features of 10 and 11, is how materialized views work. You can't do that either. No foreign tables. 
You can't create a publication that is an FDW. That's the foreign tables. You can, however, of course, assuming Postgres, create a publication from the source of the foreign table. You just can't use the foreign data wrapper table to replicate. And you have to replicate the child partitions if you're using partitioning, not the parent. Primary key limitation. This is actually something, in my opinion, we shouldn't have done um, because you shouldn't design a database without primary keys, period. If you don't have a primary key on your table, it's broken. But if you don't, you can say, alter whatever table, <laughs> rep test, replica identity full, and it will be able to replicate that table. Now you think to yourself, okay, so what? It doesn't have a primary key. Well, the problem is, is that in order to replicate that table, it has to essentially generate a where clause for every column within that table so that each tuple matches for the publication. It's an extreme performance hit. It's just not worth it. Just add a primary key. If you don't have a primary key, just, just use big serial or identity and create that as your primary key, even if you don't need it. It just makes everything in your world easier. Limitations with conflicts. Remember that a subscriber is writable. It's not read-only. Unlike binary replication, if you change data on the subscriber table, the data between the publication and the subscription may differ. Further conflicts break replication. What do I mean by that? Throw a single foreign key error on your subscription and replication stops. Another reason you cannot, will not, should not use this for high availability. It just stops. Even better, it doesn't tell you. You have to figure it out on your own. It's magic that way. The following will not work. If you are a publisher and you want to replicate from public, and when I say public, I'm talking about the schema, public, public.foo, replicating to subscriber private.foo. Now, this is not a technical limitation. It's a time limitation. I actually asked the hackers about this. It would be a neat feature. It could be very useful to be able to tell a subscription, I want to replicate into a different schema. There's all kinds of reasons to do this. You also cannot do publisher public.foo replicates to subscriber partitioned public.foo. And that's unfortunate because think about back when we were talking about the edge servers where we have multiple data points that are going into a single server. So we have multiple publications, or excuse me, multiple publishers pushing into a single subscription. You could end up with billions of rows. It would be nice if, based on what row is being processed and logically replicated, if it would automatically insert, update, or delete into a subscribed partition set. Unfortunately, uh, we can't do that right now. That is also a time thing. Patches welcome. Special care must be taken with partition tables as well. Here's an example. In order to replicate partition tables, you must create a publication which contains each base table within the partition set you wish to replicate. For example, this is a simple partition creation. Create table part test, ID big int, test text. Okay, it's simple two column. One of them would probably be my primary key, which I don't have here. Uh, excuse me, it doesn't actually, primary keys in 10 do not work on partition sets. They do work on 11. On 11, you can have primary keys across your partition sets. Um, you create table part test zero, which is a partition of part test for values one to 100. And then you create a table part test one, partition of part test for values from 101 to 200. So I've got two partitions, each partition with only 100 rows, which is kind of a waste. It really should be more like 100 million rows, but still. And then I create a publication. Create publication, part test, for table, part test zero, part test one. So now I have a publication that I can subscribe to, but the key here is that it, does, it is not for the table part test. 
part, it, logical replication doesn't know how to deal with that because the parent table is basically an envelope. It's veneer over the real tables. Can't believe the first time you publicly spoke was in front of this audience. You guys are great. The role uh, security, the role used for replicate the replication connection. So when we were creating um, our user to connect with, must have the replication attribute. To create a publication, the user must have the create privilege in the database. Doesn't it have to be a super user to create a publication, but you must have create. To add tables to a publication, the user must have ownership rights on the table. So if the user that is, you're trying to add, the, that owns the tables does, is not part of the publication, then you're not going to be able to add to it. Uh, to, 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 to create a publication that publishes all tables automatically, the user must be a super user. That makes perfect sense because you could have a database with 50 or 100 users all own their own tables, but Joe doesn't own table bar, so therefore table bar cannot be added to a publication unless it's Joe or a super user. To create a subscription, the user must be a super user. This absolutely makes sense. It's a little bit of a frustrating limitation because you don't want to have you don't want to give away super user to everybody, but you also don't want to be able to just have anybody say, hey, I can subscribe to this publication and get this data. It should be a super user. And the subscription apply process will run in the local database with the privileges of a super user. Some considerations. As I mentioned before, each sync is an internal copy and snapshot. Beware of large, long-running syncs. If you have got a billion row table, think about the fact that you are literally copying a billion row table. It is not smart enough to say, I'm going to copy the first 100 million rows and commit, and then the second 100 million rows and commit. It's going to copy the entire billion rows all at once. And if your subscription has multiple tables like that, it can be very painful, not only on your master server or your publisher, but also on your network. Each replication slot is a separate connection, thus parallel streams, which in turn can cause a copy. That could be a potential performance hit long-running transactions and or cause bloat due to limitations with vacuum or auto vacuum. The part I don't say here, although I imply it, is a separate connection. So it can, de it can interact with your max connections. You could actually DOS yourself if you're not careful. Here's an example architecture. So in the yellow, we have two applications. We have our public facing sales database, and then we have our human resources database, plus a full subscriber to the sales DB. So the read write sales DB is doing binary full replication to a disaster recovery hot standby. But we also have a human resources DB that is receiving via subscription the sales data but the sales database doesn't touch or have anything to do with the human resources data. And then we have our full data set of the full subscriber plus human resources database using binary replication to another hot standby. So you can see through this that it's, there's quite a bit of flexibility if you know what you're doing. And if you limit logical replication to what it's really intended for, it's a great tool. Here's another example architecture. This is actually a problem we solved for a client. We have US primary table group A and we have Asian primary table group B. As you can see, we're replicating bi-directionally. Now what does this mean? What's actually happening is that because of regulatory issues, they can't share all their data. There is specific data, specific tables in the US 
that must transmit specific information to Asia so that the Asian factory knows what products to manufacture. Likewise, exactly the same thing, but in reverse, there is certain information in the Asian uh, group that the U.S. needs to know about, but they're not allowed to see all of it. So it becomes a circle. We end up in a situation where manufacture this has been manufactured, committed back, but we don't have to replicate the entire database. We only replicate the allowed information. We also, because we have great bandwidth in the USA, we have a synchronized, a synchronous binary replication to a secondary for high availability and reporting. And then in Asia, we have an asynchronous binary replication just in case. Here's some neat tricks. This works on the publisher. You can create table foo have a two-column table, bar text, baz, integer, which replicates to the subscriber, I should say subscription and publication, create table foo, bar, baz, employees. Now, you can't do it the other way. It has to be the publisher has identical but less columns, but on the subscription, you can have identical but more columns. So you are able to do that. People say, you know, why in the world would I do that? Well, think of like a user's table where you're authenticating. So on the, your various publishers or your various publications, you have these user tables where everybody authenticates off of, but on the subscription, it, it comes down and then maybe you keep notes on the subscription. But you don't need those notes on your authentication tables. You only need it on the metadata tables associated with it. It is just native logical decoding. It's just the Postgres version. So for example, you could use a plugin to instead of publishing to Postgres, you could publish to Kafka. You could publish to MySQL. Good God, why? I have no idea, but you could. I even give you a link to where it exists. If you guys are feeling like you really want to hurt yourself and you, know, you enjoy the pain of it, please feel free. Write it up afterwards, because I want to hear about it. You can replicate to MongoDB. That's also something that I'm not sure why you would do at all. In fact, I'd probably use MySQL first. And I'm saying that as never using MySQL. Um, and we also have PG Logical. Now, uh, you know, obviously in 9.6, this is how you got logical replication with, with 9.6. But in 10 and 11, PG Logical adds some nice features. It's just an extension over the top, including uh, schema replication so you don't have to use the PG dump stuff, and conflict resolution in case that happens to you. And then we have some management. This is the boring part because no one ever wants to mess with this after the fact. We're going to do a little managing of publications and a little managing of subscriptions. We can alter our publication. We choose what name that we're of the publication we're altering. We can add a table. We can add all the tables. We can set the table to certain parameters. We can drop the table from a publication. We can set the publication parameter. If I recall correctly, the only publication parameters right now is that DML example I showed you, where you can say insert, delete. You can change the owner and you can rename it to a new name. Subscriptions can do a little bit more. Um, you can change your connection info. You can change which publication you're supposed to be connecting to with publication options. You can refresh the publication that basically resyncs the tables that you're subscribed to. You can specify whether existing data in the publications that are being subscribed to should be copied once the replication starts. The default is true, meaning you can say, if you say false there, you end up with a subscription that's ready, but not actually accepting any data. It's just waiting for you to say, go ahead. You can enable the subscription. You can disable the subscription. You can alter parameters originally set by the create subscription. Currently, the only options are slot name, which is your replication slot, or, your syn or synchronous commit. Don't use synchronous commit with logical replication.
it's a bad idea. Just if, if you're thinking, ooh, I can make sure this is automatically synchronous, yes, and it's going to break. You can change the owner, and you can rename it to a new name. You can monitor it. It does give you some basic information. I'm not going to get real deep into this. If you're interested, just do a select star and read the docs. But you can see the OID of the subscription, the name of the subscription, the process ID of the subscription worker process. That could be useful in determining where your CPU cycles are going. Um, you can do the rel ID, which is the OID of the relation that the worker is currently synchronizing. That's actually pretty helpful because if you have a subscription, especially with a lot of tables or all tables, you can use that OID and map that to PG class to find out which table is taking so long to actually get caught up. And then you can manage accordingly. Maybe you change the subscription and then you change that table to a partition set or something like that. Uh, the received LSN is the last write ahead log location received. The initial value of this field is zero. And then you can see the send time of the last message received from the origin. You can see the receipt time of the last message received from the origin sender. You can see the last write ahead log location reported to the origin wall sender. And then you can see the time of the last write ahead log location reported to the origin wall sender. All of those are basically useful for monitoring. You want to know how long stuff is taking. Why is this going so slow or fast or, you know, it's taking too long so let's alert and dig into it or something like that. And there you go. Any questions? Thank you uh, for your presentation. Uh, I've got some questions. Uh, first of all, uh, as far as I understood, uh, just uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, it's impossible to subscribe a publication uh, to a different schema than original. That's correct. You uh, have to have yeah. the schemas be identical. The, this means also that uh, you cannot uh, subscribe uh, uh, one publication uh, to the same subscriber more than once. And you can't, uh, let's say, create a publication uh, and subscribe it uh, to the same database. That would, yes, that would be correct. You, that would be circular. Uh, okay, uh, second question is uh, about uh, altering publications. Uh, what is uh, the behavior of uh, subscriptions uh, in this case? Uh, how, let's say, uh, newly added tables uh, will be refreshed? Okay, so as long as the table already exists on the subscriber, it'll just work. Mm -hmm. um, but because we don't replicate schemas or DDL, you must, the way you would do that is you would add the table on the subscriber. Remember, subscriptions don't actually know anything. They just say, give me what I'm subscribed to. So as long as you say, okay, I know that I'm going to add a table to this publication, you add it to the subscriber first, then you add it to the publication, and it will just work. Uh, this means uh, if uh, we have a table on the subscriber, it uh, will uh, replicate automatically since we are adding it to the to, to the publisher, to the publication. To yes. The publication. Yeah. Okay. And uh, the last question is uh, about: uh, Is there uh, some maybe way to deal with uh, those uh, huge tables? Uh, is there any chance to pre-sync it somehow before? Uh, sub you, you can well, no, not easily. So obviously, if the table is not receiving updates, you, you might be able to do that because I don't it's not going to delete the data on the subscription. So you could, in theory, if the publication table that is large is uh, not currently being updated, you could take a quick backup of it and put it on the, in, on the subscriber and then publish and then any th new thing would add to it. 
but a better solution would be if the table is if the table is big enough to where you're concerned about it, the table should be partitioned. And then what you can do is create multiple publications for a set number of partitions. So let's say you have 100 partitions. And after, actually, you don't even have to do that if you, well, yeah, you would want to do that. If you have 100 partitions, you could create 10 publications, each with 10 of the partitions, and then manage it that way. So you're only doing copies of, say, 10 of the tables at a time instead of one massive table. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, uh, can I uh, publish only some fields from table? No. It has to be the whole table. Um, the only difference to that is, as I showed you, you could have different columns on the subscriber. Okay. That would be a cool yeah. feature, though. Uh, do you have any plans to add uh, this partial re re logical replication to to PG logical? I'm. What do you mean partial? Like uh, previous. Uh, oh, you mean uh, for? Uh, to my knowledge, there's no current plans. Uh, that doesn't mean that people aren't thinking about it. It obviously would be a nice solution to be able to say, I only want to replicate the columns of you know, these three columns of this table. Um, Really, the, the main feature set that's being looked at right now is things like pluggable storage. Um, but there's no reason why it couldn't be added. And especially, actually, it might be relatively easy to do with, I, and I do mean relatively, with PG logical versus actually having to patch the back end. Okay. Anybody else? Thank you. Uh, what prevent us, me, 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 in, the, in your ride? Ah, there you are. I'm sorry. I'm yeah. trying to find this. <laughs> okay. So what prevents us to uh, have a uh, replication on uh, DDL, uh, sequence, anything? Uh, so sequence is a tricky problem. The DDL one is just, it's just a time limitation thing. Um, and you can do get that from PG Logical. So if you are looking for the DDL replication, PG Logical is open source. So I would just use that. So is it the plugin one you mean? Uh, say that again? Uh, the plugin one. What does what it mean, the PG Logical? PG Logical is an extension. Extension, the plugin yeah. one. Yeah, okay. the, from second quadrant. Oh, okay. Hi, Nikki. Hey. Uh, so, my question is uh, Is there any work uh, with regard to moving the decoding to the client side so that we can reduce the load on the publisher? Or do you oh, you would, mean the decoding would, would, part? Yeah, yeah. Would that make any, any uh, sense? It, it would I don't think that would make sense because the decoding, and actually if you think about it, the decoding does take place on the subscriber because what's happening is we are shipping the logical wall. And so it's when you connect to the, it's when you connect to the publication from the subscription that you're just receiving the information. There's not a whole lot to, I, I, I don't think, let me think about this for a second. So the way it currently works is that the wall ha is just all the logical entries. And then when you create a publication, we're going, the parser is going to know which logical entries to push into the replication slot for the subs subscription to pull from. So yes, in theory, if you were to change that so that we were streaming all of the wall to the subscriber, and then the subscriber would do the parsing, it would be uh, a little less intensive, but you're really talking about CPU cycles. You're not talking about saving anything else. Uh, my thinking was rather like filter part of the wall on the publisher and then decode. The actual decoding would be done on the client, but I guess that's a bit too complex, right? Yeah, I think so. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, yeah hi. Thank you for your talk. Uh, I ask I ask question about you mentioned that there is some problem with the create publications synchronously. Is how in which ways it can break? Okay, so the problem with synchronous replication is if you're using logical replication. Well, okay, there's two parts to this. There's synchronous commit, and then there's synchronous replication. The problem with synchronous commit in general is it's slow. Okay, you, it will require that the subscription says, I have received this and written it before you can continue. So it's going to adversely and directly affect 
the interactivity in your transactions per second on the publisher. The problem with synchronous replication is that, especially if you only have two nodes, if you have more than two, it's a, it's a little more uh, robust, but if you only have two nodes, what will happen is, is if anything stops the subscriber, whether it be an outage, whether it be a lock, whatever, it essentially creates an outage on your publisher. And because it, the publisher says, I can't continue because we're synchronous until I know that my subscriber is in sync with me. Those are your limitations. Yeah, okay, thank you. And se second one, I want to ask, can I use a logical and uh, binary replication on, on, on the same node? Oh, absolutely. Oh, that's, okay. that's actually the, the, the main benefit to me is that I can have my binary replication with my hot standbys and my high availability, and then for specific data sets that I need to ship out either to edge servers for metadata or sessions or whatever, I can do that. Uh, yeah, it's kind of plan to separate the production environment and something for special needs for well, yeah, reports. I mean, think of a, uh, a caching server of JSON data. Right? You don't, you don't want to have it touch your, your main production instance. You just have it logically replicate out to these little or these smaller edge servers or instances. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for presentation. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so we already have a big table, and I want to ask you about, is it make sense to make a binary copy, a physical replication, to another server, and then activate it and create subscription with copy data to false, set to false. So it will not copy all the table, but you will already have almost all data. I think that it will be a well, little Well, yeah, that's what I was mentioning earlier, is that if you have the capability, I mean, obviously it depends on your business requirements, but if you have the capability to enforce that this table has been replicated through binary replication, and then you turn off binary replication, um, and then you create the subscription. That is absolutely one way to deal with it. Uh, your problem is, is if there's modifications to the table while that's happening. And there's ways around that, right? You could use auditing, for example. You could use like PG audit and you would know, okay, uh, I replicated this whole table using standard streaming replication, uh, so I didn't have to deal with the large transaction. And then all the changes that were happening while I did that, I have those in my PG audit table, and then I can apply those. So it's certainly there are ways to work with it, yes. Mm -hmm. I remember the second question. Do you heard about Oracle Golden Gate? I don't work with evil. <laughs> no, I, I haven't. I, I know, I mean, obviously I know what Oracle is, and I know what Rack is, and things like that. I've not heard of Golden Gate. Oh, okay, okay, thank you. You're welcome. I don't. I don't work with evil. I am all about the good. Uh, can I save the publishing as a, as a file, as a playback, uh, save as a file and use later? Uh, does it exist uh, like a plain file? Uh, not natively. But since it's logical decoding, there is actually a module that you can use. It will actually write it out to CSV. So you can just say, you know, I, I've subscribed to this public, you know, I have a subscription using this module and whatever comes across through the publication from the, log, from the logical stream will just write out to say a CSV. And then, yeah, you have your flat file. And uh, another question about the same, uh, can I publish between two points of time? Uh, Expand push, on that push, a push uh, packet changes between these points of time, this publishing uh, from the publisher? The, kind of. The closest you could get would be to disable and, and then re-enable. So you could disable the subscription from receiving and then you could re-enable, but it's not going to be like point in time recovery or anything like that. Yeah, yeah it's, it's not what I want. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes, hi. Right. Um, well, let's say I want to use a logical replication and everything. Um, is there any chance uh, that I harm my uh, master server? 
I mean, if I even use not in sync uh, replication. So uh, I'm asking uh, because in a binary replication, um, when, whenever a uh, repl replica is going down, I, I can possibly get uh, some wall files uh, overflowing and everything with it. So uh, my question is, is it the same logic with uh, logical replication? Thank you. Well, so keep in mind that when you're doing logical replication, you are still using the wall. It's just essentially filtering the wall. So in theory, yes. Uh, I don't think it's going to be what you're looking for. Um, it would be more, in that environment, it would be very forensic, right? You would have to really dig into it to figure out what changed. Uh, in that environment, my recommendation, and, and I recommend this always, is that you have your primary and you have your secondary, and that is binary replication. That is what you're doing. And then your logical replication, that goes to a different server. So no matter what happens, you've got that backup of that secondary that's binary replication. Anybody else? All right, thank you very much. It's been excellent.